section is a little bit about mapping plasmids and why we map plasmids and how restriction enzymes work. It's a little tutorial. So first of all, on this slide, you can see that there are several different restriction enzymes and each one has a specific site that it looks for on a DNA. When that enzyme finds that particular site, it will then cut the DNA. So if we look at several of these, there's really only two things I'd like for you to know. Number one is that when um, there is an enzyme that cuts this way in a staggered cut, it creates what are called sticky ends. And these sticky ends will now stick to anything that is cut with the same enzyme. Um, on the other hand, if we look at this one right here, this one gives us what are called blunt ends. It makes a straight cut separating the pieces. It's not useful when we are wanting to transform something, like putting a gene of a jellyfish into a bacteria, for example, but it's still useful for cutting DNA at sites, for example, to do a DNA fingerprinting or something like that. It's still going to be very specific. It's only gonna cut the DNA when it finds a specific sequence. This was something that was on a worksheet, just really quick to show you. I could give you something like this on a test. I could ask you to tell me how many pieces of DNA you end up with here and how many cuts the enzyme makes. Since this enzyme reads, ECOR1 reads in the 5-3 direction, this is going to read this direction on this strand and backwards on the other one. If we find the code on one strand, you can assume that the code is going to be a, a palindrome. It's going to be the other direction on the other strand. So this one looks for GAATTC. It cuts between the G and the A. And so here's our code, GAATTC. It's going to cut here. On the other side, it's going to cut here. And we would get a staggered cut that would make sticky ends. This particular enzyme ends up cutting over here as well. So in this case, you would end up with three total pieces of DNA, two cuts, and that would give us, like I said, three pieces. Um, the one at the bottom, I'm not going to go through, but you can see that in this case, they're going to have you cut uh, with two different enzymes. Each one will look for a specific uh, code, and then it would make its cuts. Now, in bacteria, a lot of times the DNA we're cutting is actually going to be circular, a plasmid. It's not going to be straight. Um, and so what we want to do, for example, let's say this is a plasmid that we're starting with. It's got three specific genes on it. It's got a TET gene, and that gene is for tetracycline resistance. It's got an AMP gene, AMP, for ampicillin resistance, and a PENN gene for penicillin resistance. So let's just say that this is a plasmid that we're working with. Um, and let's say that we have this long strand of DNA, and on this strand of DNA, we have the gene for making human insulin. And what we want to do is we want to create a plasmid that will then be put into a bacteria, and then that bacteria would be able to create human insulin. And so that's what, that's what our goal would be. What we would want to do is we would first of all need to cut both things with the same restriction enzyme, because if we do that, then the sticky ends would stick to each other. So let's just say, for example, we have a restriction enzyme, let's say ECOR1, and ECOR1 makes a cut here on our plasmid. And let's say that ECOR1 makes two cuts here. It makes one right here, and it makes another one over here. Well, the fact that it makes two cuts here is good because that would mean that we would have our plasmid. We would open our plasmid up. We would take our segment, and we'd stick our segment in. The problem is that ECOR1, in this example, cuts right in the middle of the insulin gene. If it cuts in the middle of the gene, that gene will no longer be functioning. So what we want to look for when we're creating a plasmid is we want to find a restriction enzyme that will cut our DNA uh, that we want to place in there, cut it so that we have our sticky ends, but we want to avoid cutting on the actual gene that we're trying to put into the plasmid. Otherwise, it's a complete waste of time. So let's say, uh, on the other hand, we find that HEND3, let's just say, we find that HEND3 cuts the plasmid right here, and it cuts our DNA here and here. So this is HEND3, this is HEND3. Now what would happen is we would open up our plasmid, and our gene would then get put in right here, and it would get sealed with ligase, here and here, 
And we would now have created a plasmid that has, here's our insulin gene. And we also had already on here a penicillin gene and a tetracycline gene. And we had an ampicillin gene, but if you notice, our ampicillin gene sort of got split here. All right. So you could be given a, a situation like this, and then you could be given a series of Petri dishes and told that different things were on each of these dishes, and you could be asked what would grow on each of these dishes. So let's say we created this plasmid, we put it into a bacteria, and in that bacteria, we now put a sample of that bacteria on three different uh, Petri dishes. Let's say that this one, um, is just LB Luria agar, which is just, let's just say this is just food. This one is going to be the same thing, but in addition, we've added ampicillin to it. And let's say that this third one is also gonna be uh, agar, but this one we've added tetracycline to it. And we could be asked which one of these would do the job of screening the bacteria and have the correct thing grow. Well, if we take a look at this, in our first one, since we only have food, there's no screening tool whatsoever. So what's gonna happen in our first Petri dish is that all of our bacteria are gonna grow. The ones that picked up the plasmid for human insulin would grow, the ones that did not pick up the plasmid for human insulin would, would also grow. So this would not work as a way to screen our bacteria if we're looking to get a pure sample. In our second dish, we have our agar and we have ampicillin. The problem is when we created our plasmid, we happened to use an enzyme, if we go back up here, that chopped up the area where the ampicillin resistance gene was located. So you would end up with basically no growth here because if they didn't pick up the plasmid, ampicillin would kill them. And even if they picked up the plasmid, ampicillin would still kill them. This one, our tetracycline plate would work because our plasmid contains resistance to tetracycline, and if our bacteria picked up our plasmid, it should have picked up that gene as well as the gene to make human insulin. So this plate would proper, properly screen our bacteria so that we got a pure sample of bacteria that picked up our plasmid. This is just a diagram showing exactly what I just explained. Um, here's E. R1. This is the DNA we wanna put in the plasmid. We cut it. We cut the plasmid open with the same exact enzyme so we get our sticky ends. Here's our final plasmid. We put our plasmid into a bacteria and then we can screen the bacteria to see which ones picked up the plasmid. All the ones that didn't pick it up will die because they will be killed by the antibiotic. The ones that did pick up the, the plasmid will survive, they'll grow. And then we can purify it and we can actually then pull the plasmids out and make lots and lots of copies of them. So this would be the technique we actually would use in the lab to create a bacteria. Okay, so in this next section, we're gonna go over how we can actually map a plasmid. So in this case, you're actually given two different sets of information. The information is the same. It's just being represented two different ways. So you could either be given the chart on the left or you could be given the electrophoresis picture on the right. Both of these represent the same thing. They represent two different enzymes. Uh, here's HIND3 and the second one is ECO R1 and the same thing here. Here's ECO R1 and here's HIND3. And then they put the two enzymes together and the goal here is you want to try to map where these two enzymes cut this plasmid in relation to each other. Well, HEN3 only cuts the plasmid one time. I know this because if we cut a circular plasmid once, we're actually only gonna end up with one piece. We're not going to end up with more than one because the first cut only opens the circle. If this was a linear plasmid, one cut would automatically give us two pieces. So I know that my plasmid is 50 base pairs long. And I can double check this by adding up my numbers when we cut it with eco R1, and you'll see that that adds up also to 50. In other words, if I have a piece of DNA, it doesn't matter how many times I cut it. If I add all the pieces together, I should add up to the same total. It should add up to the size of my original piece of DNA. So um, the way to do this, the best way to do this is to start with the enzyme that cuts the plasmid the most. In this case, that's our eco R1. 
it cuts the plasmid three times. It cuts it into a piece that's 30 base pairs long, a piece that's 15 base pairs long, and a piece that's five base pairs long. This is also represented over here. Here's our 30, our 15, and our five. Notice this is an electrophoresis. So the pieces that were smaller traveled further. That's why the five is all the way down near the bottom. So I'm gonna look at this sort of like it's a clock. If this was sort of like a clock and the whole circle represents per a period of 50, I can assume that if this is like 12 o'clock and our first cut is here, eco R1. If we were to make a cut right here, down at the bottom, that would represent a piece on the right that was approximately 25 long. So I know that I have a piece that's 30 long, so I'm gonna make my cut here, and I'm gonna write eco R1, and then I'm gonna write over here 30, showing that when I make those two cuts and I run an electrophoresis, I would get a piece that's 30 base pairs long. I know my other two pieces are 15 and five. So I'm gonna make my next line over here, eco R1, giving me a piece that's 15 and a piece that's five. Technically, I could actually make this line that I made up here, make it down here and make my five at the bottom. It doesn't matter. So now what I need to do is figure out where Hindi three cuts this plasmid. I know it only makes one cut, but the question is where in relation to eco R1 is that cut? The easiest way to figure this out is to go to our, what we call the double digest, this one, and see which pieces are still the same length that they were before. Well, if I look at this, my 15 piece and my five piece are still the same size. What that tells me is that eco R1 cut it here and cut it here, and these two pieces, when HEND3 is added, are still the same length. So HEND3 must not be cutting in that area. It must be cutting on the other side. So I say, okay, so HEND3 cut on the other side, you'll notice it makes a 20 and a 10. In other words, my 30 that I had before, I won't get that band anymore. Because now when the ECO R1 and the HEND3 are added together, this one is now gonna get cut into a, um, a 10 and a 20. So I'm gonna make this one, let's just say my 10, and this one up here my 20, and I'm gonna write hand three. It could also just as easily have been put up here and had the 10 from here to here and the 20 on, on the other area. Let me show you another one really quickly. So here's another one. If we add this up, we see eco R1 cuts this one time. And it, and it gives me one piece that's 40 base pairs long. I can double check that and I will see that when I cut it with the other enzyme, I still get 40 when I add all the pieces together. And when I cut it with both, I still get 40. So I'm going to say that my plasmid is 40 base pairs long. I'm going to map the one that cuts multiple times first. So I'm gonna start at 12 o'clock and I'm going to write BAM H1. Since my whole thing is 40, and my biggest piece ends up being 24. I know that's a little over halfway, so I'm gonna mark this as 24, and I'm gonna write BAM H1. My other two pieces are 12 and four, so I'm gonna put my third cut over here, BAM H1, four, 12. Now what I need to do is figure out where my ECO R1 cuts in relation to my other cuts. What I can see here is that I have my piece that was 12 long and my piece that was four long and neither of those have been cut. So that tells me that right here and right here are preserved. My eco R1 must be cutting on the other side. My 24 has now been cut into a 16 and an eight. So I can draw my line either up here and make it eight and 16 and label this eco R1, or I could just as easily have put that line down there and made 16 my bigger piece. And that's basically how you do it. Um, if you were only given something like this really quick, you can make your same chart. Eco R1 made one piece, it was 34. Fam made a 22 and a 12, and then all three, uh, the two together made a 16, a 12, and a 6.